Hey everybody, I have got a good one for you today, and boy has it taken me a while to learn and prepare this video. So I'm excited to show you how to do some basic textural analysis of a raster image in QGIS 3.1. So what is textural analysis? Basically, it's uh, computing statistical metrics on a raster that are sensitive to the texture or the distribution of bright versus dark pixels in an image. And the reason we want to do this, among other things, is if we can, if we can generate statistics that qu quantify these textural differences, we can then use them as inputs into classifiers and, and, and have much higher quality classified images. So in this video, it's going to have two parts. Part one, I'm just going to introduce you to textural analysis, a little bit of the theory, as much as I can understand. Then in part two, I'm going to show you how to use the recode and texture tools in QGIS to actually produce rasters that uh, have these textural metrics. Um, if you're new to remote sensing, uh, I'm going to assume you have a lot of prior knowledge. You may want to check out these videos. Um, in particular, if you're in my class, uh, you may want to check out these last two that remind you how to do some of the basic operations in QGIS. What I'm going to tell you now is based on a, a nice little web publication called Texture Analysis by Michael Wirth. Find it on the web. It's awesome. Really straightforward and helpful. So in this web document, the first thing they say is, what is texture? Right? Texture is the pattern of dark and light pixels in an image. So in this example, all three of these images have the same percent of dark and light, but totally different textures. This one has two blocks, this one has stripes, this one has a checkerboard pattern. So if you can quantify those differences, that's a very powerful tool to help you differentiate them in an image, okay? Now, as we set out to do this, it's very important to understand all these calculations are done in a moving window. So we always consider texture not across the whole image at one time, but within a moving window. So here's a raster with a bunch of pixel values, right? Here is our moving window. In this case, it's a three by three pixel moving window. They're almost always square. But you can tell it if you want five by five, nine by nine, it always has to be an odd number. Um, and the reason it always has to be an odd number is because we're always gonna be computing a, a metric for the central pixel. So this window slides around, it centers itself over every pixel in the input raster, makes some calculation, and then it assigns the result of that calculation to a new output raster. So every pixel in the output raster is basically going to be the, the computational result of this, this moving window as it went over the original raster. So that's really important. We're, we're, compute, we're calculating a whole new output raster. A couple other important things to say are that the result of your textural metric is going to be very dependent on the size of the window that you uh, use. So for example, let's say you're doing something like standard deviation of all the pixels in this image, right? You may have a very different standard deviation in a 9x9 nine nine window than in a 3x3 three three window, right? Um, so just keep that in mind. And often with textural analysis, it's, it's common to try different sized windows, and you actually get different different information from a 3x3 three three versus a 9x9 nine nine window. Another thing to point out is that typically in textural analysis, we don't need to convert a satellite image into reflectance or into radiance. It's usually fine just to use the digital numbers themselves um, because they do capture the, the patterns, right? They capture the patterns of light and dark that we're looking for. We don't need to go to reflectance to see those patterns. Quick examples of some of the simplest textural metrics you can use. Range would just be the maximum minus the minimum values within your window, right? And you imagine if max minus min is big, that means you have a rough surface. If max minus min is small, it means you have a smooth surface, right? So with that simple metric, you're already learning about texture. Uh, variance or standard deviation I just mentioned. So variance is computed by um, summing the square of the difference between the brightness of the central pixel and its neighbors in the window. Right? So it's a sum of the square difference. 
between the central pixel and its neighbors. Uh, high variance means you have high variability in your window. Now, beyond some of these simple ones, almost all textural metrics require uh, pretty complex matrix operations. And many of these are based on what's called a co-occurrence matrix, in which you essentially um, take your window, in this case a 5 by 5 window, and you, you look at it from different directions, um, different dimensions, and you basically assess um, how often these numbers co-occur with each other. How often do they co-occur if you look at it on this angle? How often do they co-occur if you look at it coming across this angle, right? And then you build a matrix that kind of captures these co-occurrence rates, basically, and the, the, their pattern. And then from this matrix, you can extract all kinds of statistics. I really urge you to look at this document by Michael Wirth. It explains it all very clearly. Okay, so switching now to QGIS. How do we actually calculate texture in QGIS? Um, we're going to use two, two GRASS tools. So these are tools that are part of the GRASS package, but are available in QGIS. And the first one is called R Recode. What this essentially allows us to do is take a raster and assign, uh, let's say your raster has the values 0 to 50, right? It's going to allow you to re-bin those or recode the values into, typically into fewer values, okay? Um, and the reason we would do this for textural uh, purposes is because it's going to make, if you have fewer integer values in your raster, it's going to make this kind of co-occurrence matrix um, much smaller and much simpler. This matrix is, this, is 3 by 3 because we only have 3 integer choices in the image. If you have 200 integer choices, this becomes a 200 by 200 matrix. The calculations take longer and may have more trouble identifying patterns. So if you have fewer integers in your image, um, it's faster and I think easier to identify patterns and textures. So that's why we want to use the recode tool. Okay, so here's the syntax for the recode. It's a text file that has a bunch of rows in it, and those rows go um, the old low value to the old high. So the range that you're trying to reclass, and then the new low to the new high, and the range that you now want to map things into, okay? So we're gonna have a bunch of rows that specify those values. Or you can do old low, old high to a new value. Okay, so once we've recoded the raster, we're then going to use the QGIS tool R Texture, and we're going to run R Texture on the the recoded raster. And this R Texture is the algorithm that actually computes all the textural metrics. And here uh, are a bunch of them. And honestly, I don't understand them all. Some of them sound familiar, though. Entropy is one. Variance. We just talked about that. Um, angular second momentum, contrast, correlation. So these are pretty complex metrics and really powerful tool. So before we go to the QGIS, if you're in my class, um, please read, please pause the video, read this list very closely. This is a list of things you need to do to prepare to go forward with this video and the subsequent videos. So make sure you've done these things to get your GIS project ready. All right, so with that said, let's head into the QGIS. Um, we're working in this series of videos on an example from Yellowstone National Park, uh, a Landsat TM image collected in 1989 uh, after the big wildfires in the park. And our goal is going to be ultimately to collect, uh, excuse me, to classify the Landsat image um, and make a map that shows burned areas, which are here, these kind of darker areas, versus unburned areas, right? So the burned areas are these dark ones. So that's our ultimate goal. And right now, we're just going to create a textural, a bunch of textural rasters that we can then use as an input into classification. OK, so first I want to show you how, about how I've prepared a list of rules to input into the recode algorithm. So I've prepared them in a Word document. It's worth noting that there is a tool, r.quantile, that lets you prepare these automatically uh, by computing 
quantile divisions in your raster, but I wasn't able to make that work, um, but I'm sure you can make it work if you have the time. So what I did is I just borrowed the syntax shown in the r.recode tool and created a list. So what this shows is anything from minus 10,000 to one gets assigned to zero. Anything from one to 10 gets assigned to two and so on and so forth. Um, and by the, and I'm gonna save this as a text file. Okay, and I'm gonna call it recode rules. I'm just gonna use plain text. You may have to experiment with a text format that works for you, but I don't think it's too picky. And by the way, how did I figure out these intervals? Notice I only really went up to 50 with my reclassification. The way I figured that out was by looking at the histogram. And oh, one thing I should mention is we're only going to do this operation on our band 2 raster. So I've added just a single band 2. Um, I am not going to do this on the full band stack. I don't actually know how it would do it on the band stack. It seems to do the math, but I, I'm not sure if it's just doing it on the first band or what. So probably safest to do this textual analysis on single bands until you know better. Um, so we're going to do this on band two, and I right-clicked, went to properties, and I looked at the histogram, okay? I, I went down, I chose histogram. You may see a button here that says compute histogram. Hit that, it'll compute the histogram. This shows you a distribution of the pixels, right? This is a distribution of your pixel values, and I notice they only go from zero to 50, basically, for band two. So that's why I chose rebinning categories that range from 0 to 50 in increments of 5. But again, you can do whatever you like. OK, so now let's use the recode tool. I've got it up here in my processing toolbox. I searched for it. And I'm going to set this to make sure I'm on the correct uh, band 2 image here. Right, I'm not on my full multi-band raster. I'm just going to do this to band 2, single band. Here I'm going to give it the file containing the recode values. So go to wherever you saved your text file and call up your recode rules that we just created. And I'm going to just leave this as a temporary file and hit run and hope for the best. OK, the tool has finished. We'll close it. And it loaded the recoded raster. And it looks like it worked after lots of trial and error, I won't lie. Um, so this is the recoded raster. If we open it up, notice that the raster that previously had continuous values from like 0 to 50 now is binned entirely from 0 to 11. I'm not actually sure why it's still showing these values down up to 255, but I don't believe they exist in the raster. The raster now has only 0 to 11. We can check that by going and looking at the histograms. Right-click, Properties, Histogram, Compute Histogram, and you can see our histogram is indeed now focused between numbers 0 and 11. So we'll hit OK. Good. So now this is now going to be our input into the textural analysis, right? We basically reclassified the raster into uh, having much fewer integers. And now we will uh, search for the, uh, the second tool, r.texture. Open that. And so now, of course, we're going to run our dot texture on the recoded raster we just made. We can click here to choose textural measurements. We're going to just choose a few. Let's go with ASM, contrast, correlation, variance. Um, let's go with uh, entropy as well and the, uh, the correlation matrix. So we'll hit OK. I'm going to use a, I think, a 7 by 7 moving window. And I'm going to keep the, the dis distance equal to 1 uh, so we get the full pixel cor correlation. Um, I'm going to save this to a temper. Actually, no, we're going to put this in a, a directory. This creates a bunch of output files. So you want to actually create a fresh directory. So I'm going to use this folder Yellowstone Landsat B2 Texture Output. Right, I named my folder with meaningful words. Select it. We'll hit Run. This will take a second to compute all these metrics. OK, the calculations have finished. I closed the output dialog window. And it doesn't add them automatically, so we'll go to uh, Add Raster. 
and go find that folder that we had just stored everything in. And here it is. And you can see for each output, it created a pair of three files, which is a, a TIFF raster plus some metadata. So I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna grab the TIFF for ASM, the TIFF for contrast, TIFF for correlation, entropy, uh, correlation matrix, and variance. We're gonna add these all at the same time. These are gonna show up, of course, as single band grayscales over here. And let's just take a second to look at these. So uh, this one on top is the variance raster. Um, you can see variance is highest in, uh, actually in river valleys where we have a lot of landslides, stuff like that. Um, here's the matrix of correlation. Tends to be high on the water where pixels are similar. Tends to be lower over rock where pixels are more uh, variant. Here's entropy, which looks like even more magnified. This looks like a really good metric for us. It's very dark over water. Actually looks possibly, I think, dark over forest, unburned forest. Um, it's less dark over burned forest, less dark over uh, rock, the rhyolite, uh, which has a lot of variable texture. And it's similar for the other ones. They're all broadly similar, although here's contrast, which like variant seems to not show as much variability. And then here's angular second moment or uniformity, which also seems like a good metric, kind of the inverse of entropy. So, you know, it may be that um, a lot of these are redundant, in fact, and maybe you don't need all of these. You certainly may not want to put all of them into a, a classification algorithm, but at least now you can see these different metrics and you can see um, study carefully what types of surface types they correspond to, and it may really help your classification. Stay tuned to our next video to learn how to do classification in QGIS.